Scotty, thank you so much. Um, I think that, that concludes all of our formal reports for the day. And uh, let's open the floor up to 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 Rick as a as a guest here. How's how's it going? And have any questions about our work or anything that you um, can recommend that we uh, look at or pay more attention to? I know that you're uh, very experienced in FPGA design and that you've worked with the Pluto quite a bit. Uh, so so any insight that you have would be uh, would be great. No, no, I have nothing special to offer. <clears throat> yeah, I missed a whole lot of meetings, so I need to catch up, but I've been extremely busy on a variety of topics, including that big dish back there. Uh, we use that big dish, by the way, to discover our very first magnetar. We've been doing only... Uh, only pulsars to this point. And I went down personally to help with the uh, discovery of our first magnetar. Oh, very and good. That, now, for, for people watching, um, you're talking about the Deep Space Exploration Society. And yes. the dish behind you is the probably the, the central piece of equipment from DSES. DSES doesn't just have this dish. They have a, a building uh, full of instruments and, and more in, more antennas uh, planned and, and on the way. Um, maybe you want to spend uh, 15 seconds or 30 seconds or so and explain maybe the context of the, of the things, uh, of, the, of this new achievement uh, from DSES. Well, it's... Uh... Uh, the dish, the big dish there is being used 50% of the time for science, like finding pulsars and magnetars and just educating ourselves. We're not yet contributing anything to science because these have already been discovered, but we are learning about astrophysics. And for an electrical engineer, that's a whole new topic. And it's exciting. We also uh, use it for EME, uh, ham radio transmissions. And there's a contest coming up uh, shortly with slow scan TV over moon bounce. I think that's absolutely crazy. Uh, old technology uh, on top of old technology. But uh, a bunch of guys want to do it. I said, fine. Uh, no problem, you know. So we have to switch out the feed or the ham radio feed. We also have a 30-foot dish, half that size, on site, ready to be uh, put together. And uh, and we are going to need some donations to help finish that. We also have an antenna for some uh, sun studies. Uh, log periodic uh, covering a wide range of frequencies will be studying sun activity. We also have a couple of antennas that are not working right now for studying Jupiter uh, radiation. And so also, uh, you, have, you have an interferometer as well, right? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a whole other story. <laughs> we, have, we have half an interferometer. The so other, you have a you have a you have an inner for a yeah the other <laughs> half is still at the television station we have to go get it it's it's ours for the taking and we have a concrete in the ground ready for the second half then we'll have an inner parameter in the meantime the Edis research box that is part of the inner parameter the a, a new B two ten brand new is sitting here in my lab uh, because I'm doing some experiments with that while the interferometer isn't finished. But the bad news is the first dish, which was mounted on an existing concrete pad, blew over. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Now, one of our board members said, you never get high winds out of Haswell, where these antennas are. Well, let me tell you, he was wrong. We okay, had, so it was installed and like like bolted installed. down, like bolted down on concrete, and it blew it over. Blew, it blew the concrete right out of the ground. 
Wow. Okay. Well, so, <laughs> do you have no, a weather? No. You have a you have a weather station out there? No, not yet. Oh, we, I that might. Weather station is in the planning stages. Okay, that might be a good thing to install so that you uh, can pr yeah. you you can prove that they uh yeah. that they're 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 high winds on the. I mean, this is this is high desert sort of right. Yeah. This well, is uh. It is. It's just, and that's low compared to me. It's right. Yeah. No, me. I would I would I would expect that there would be high winds. I mean, just judging by the the by how built the the main dish is that they they knew that well, when it was yeah, uh designed it's, it's six thousand feet above sea level it's very flat there is absolutely nothing there are no buildings no trees no nothing so if you get some nasty weather it can be nasty yeah okay uh, so, so okay so you have to put the dish back up we have to pour new concrete for that one uh we found out that the existing pad wasn't nearly big enough. Fortunately, <laughs> the new pad we built is big enough. So what we're going to do is repair. And this is dish. this is three dishes, right, for this interferometer? Well, no, for starting out with two. Okay. Uh, just to learn about interferometry, huh, I'm I want to put a third dish on like railroad tracks. Yeah. So it can be focused. Yeah, uh, that'd be cool. I've seen that done at Haystack Observatory. Uh, they have a three-dish system, and it's been rusting away for decades. But it, the third dish is on a railroad tracks, and I thought I'm trying to convince the guys to do that. So we'll see. But we start small and we grow. Yeah, no two can Anyhow, get the job done. A few weeks ago, God knows how many when I was here last. Uh, you had mentioned a book on phase lock loops and wondering if you should buy the new version. And I said, well, I have the first edition. And so I started reading the, the uh, introductions to the second and third edition. And I finally checked up the money and, ah, these background things, I bought the book. I now have the latest edition of the phase lock loop book, and I now know about the uh, appendices that you were so curious about. Yeah, so, that was uh, somebody that was um, that was working on stability of the loops that we talked about today uh, was was very interested and had gotten this book as a recommendation. So, yeah, we're very interested in hearing what you think. Uh, that I, I have mixed feelings. The appendices are not as big and complete and interesting as I'd hoped. And yet they're very uh and they're and, and they're not at the back of the book. They're not oh, where did she go? She disappeared. Oh, there you go. Uh, so there there's I go to the back of the book looking for appendices, they're not there. It turns out the appendices are attached to each chapter. <laughs> okay. Appendix, right Odd. after the chapter. That's interesting. Uh, okay. So I need to figure out what it was that, what things you were actually looking for before I can tell you if it's here. What I was looking for was uh, digital techniques, which were not in the other two books. And he does have uh, large sections now with the traditional block diagrams of digital design, which uh, could be very helpful uh, or not, depending upon how much education you need on digital phase lock loops. I need quite a bit, frankly. I'm looking at, I bought the book. It wasn't that expensive. You know, it's $100. Everything's $100 now. Uh, so I bought it because I have a digital phase lock loop project planned. And while this doesn't give me any source code, if you will, uh, it may help me uh, with the mathematics of getting started on the project I'm looking at. I hope it's brand new. I haven't read it yet. So there you go. Okay. I mean, but this is, it's brand new edition, but the book's been around for a while. I, no, I mean, brand new to me. 
Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That, that's what I meant. Uh, yeah. The book. Um, the book's been around for ten years or so. What does it say here? Third edition is two thousand five. So yeah, twenty years almost. But okay. you know, so I had the the first edition is absolutely gorgeous. It's beautifully well written. But then he tells you in the preface of this book that it was just an introduction to the topic for the people of the 1960s, you know? So this ought to help a little bit. Okay. I do appreciate, this is one of two authors that I have uh, their books on face-off loops. They're the two authors that uh, all the people whose names I won't mention who are heavy into science and math and NASA uh, recommended. And way back when yeah so i still think they're valuable okay no so yeah i think we can probably recommend it to dig in and, and get a good background then um any any guesses on why we have a problem with f2 versus f1 settings no, on the cost is loop so a... no unfortunately i don't have a clue what that's about that doesn't set you know i have I have issues like that in my commercial software that I'm writing, and it always turns out to be a bug in what I wrote. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What can I tell you? No, I think we're kind of. I think okay. So there, there's there's two loops here on two different frequencies, and the only thing that it can occur to me that occurs to me today um, is that in some cases the. Um, the loops depend on a little bit of noise and and if they're in an environment like a math land if you're just simulating uh or if you're running it directly through the device um that you don't have any noise uh so oh. if you used the same algorithm for f1 versus f2 the only difference between these two is essentially phase noise between the two that you've created because if you use the exact same approach and i don't know I don't know if that's the case, but the, and I'm starting to think that maybe the problem may be because we're too pure here, <laughs> you oh, know, the, that, that there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. perfect sense to me. If, if Well, if you were to look around my lab, you'd see all kinds of Agilent and Keysight counters. Yes. Uh, counters. I see and, a beautiful moon and clouds and, and well, a lovely dish in your I lab there. turn off the background. But I know. <laughs> If you research, how I know. Much, I mean, this is my background because you do not want to see my office. Well, that's that, <laughs> that background looks like my backyard. So no, you, you're you right. Know, you actually, you actually live there. That I, actually I, live there. I don't, I don't have any bamboo where I live. It's all palm oh, trees. Well, it's, it, for me, it's ponderosa pines, <laughs> but it's still green and it goes tall. Anyhow, um, the counters introduce noise on purpose and it has to be a specific kind of noise and you have to know a lot about noise and allen deviations and some variances and all that stuff but try introducing some random noise and random unfortunately has many mathematical iterations but yes it does all, just for now, don't worry about it. Just just pick something simple like random Gaussian noise, a very small amount, but enough to tick the lowest order bit or bits, and just see if it all of a sudden the 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 uh, loop doesn't respond interestingly to that. Okay. So you may not want to leave it in, but it's real easy to add a noise source and then take it out later if it. If it has an effect on that uh, loop, uh, then you will have learned something. Yeah, that was my thought. Is the the only thing is difference between the calculation was the two frequencies, and if one of them is dead center and and really, you know, noise. A lot of these algorithms assume some noise and need it in order to get the right traction. So Absolutely. if there's nothing, if there's nothing there, it does weird stuff. It's happened to me before, so it it occurred to me today that. And I think Paul actually tried to mention this to me before, and I did not, it did not register, which is, sorry, Paul. <laughs> so she didn't listen, huh, Paul? 
I don't, I don't know, man. I, I, you, you, working with me is such a delight. I have to say. So I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. A comment on the uh, on the loop. Um, noise would be one way, but the other way would be uh, adjusting the the frequency offset. So setting the frequency control word a little bit off should cause it to move. Um, and I, I still wasn't seeing that. So it's not noise, but it is not a perfect condition either. And oh, okay. I, was, I was surprised when I moved the frequency control word um, that, that I didn't really see much effect on the F2 loop unless I made it really, really, a really, really big offset, which basically broke everything. So Wow. It, so it's it, kind of like deaf. It's like that. Yeah. But it's not that far away from F2. No, okay. and Very the cool. other thing is, it, it's this negative value which should accumulate over time to uh, an error and, and cause a bit error. Which I, maybe I haven't run it long enough. It's probably not a real big negative offset, but it is a negative offset. So you would expect, given enough time, you would see, uh, you know, a bit error. Um, yeah. You... Huh. I wonder if any of the, like, is this something that we should like go back to the the Massey Hardgart stuff and like dig in oh. and see if there's like, is there I mean, something in it, there? It, it, it's always worth, you know, double checking everything. But what's interesting is the RTL, the, the, you know, the VHDL is the same for both loops. Right. Right. Yeah, so it is. One is working. F2 is not. It, so, I mean, the, the, the only <laughs> thing then I could think would be maybe loop gains, we might want different loop gains for, for F1 versus F2 potentially. Um, but even if I change the loop gain somewhat, I, I, you know, it still appears stuck. So it's not like, you know, the loop gains are having a significant impact or effect either. Um, so it's just, it's really weird that, yeah. you know, we're seeing the loop work well for, for F1, but then it's acting this way for F2. Um, and again, the simulation, it is somewhat dependent on loop gains, but it works, you know, in the in the simulation with the loop gains we're using on Pluto right now, I, I see F2 moving positive to negative. Um, but, you know, it's a relatively short amount of time compared to um, the Pluto, so, you know, when you're running on the Pluto. So maybe, you know, it, it it's moving at first and then, and then just kind of sticks after some time. And so, so maybe, you know, some noise might, might knock it out of that kind of stuck state so that would be an interesting experiment yeah it's an easy thing to try it's so this is really interesting and of course like this is just bait for those of us all of us here are innately curious people and this is you know <laughs> it's like wow this is you're trying to figure you know you really want to figure it figure it out um so yeah let's uh let's let's throw let's throw some noise at it and yeah, I don't know. Going back over the math seems to be, like you said, it's just a, it's it's always worth double checking. But like these papers didn't have any, any clue here. Like they didn't note yeah. anything different about F two. It's not treated any differently in the diagrams or the math or anything like that. And you, I mean, this is literally identical code. So weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's keep digging at it, and then when we understand it, uh, it'll be really. It'll be really a uh, uh, thrill to explain it and say, yeah, well, you know, this is good learner not learning opportunity. <laughs> heck yeah! No, this is great. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll uh, yeah we could try to throw some throw some noise at it. That that's good. I mean, I know that there's some there's some stability algorithms that absolutely depend on having something to get to to grip onto. You have to have something to to start to move to get you off of like essentially it's like getting trapped in a local minimum. Mm -hmm. in a way and so i know that that's a factor i didn't really it didn't seem like that that was the solution here uh, but i thought I'd, I'd bring it up especially since paul mentioned it and i was like well i don't know what he's talking about i i, I kind of put it in the back of my mind but later on i was like oh the behavior here really is pretty close to that behavior that i've seen before in a noiseless environment when everything the math is perfect the algorithm really doesn't account for no noise, nothing else except the you know initial conditions. And if you don't give it some tension, some some you know for, you know you don't give it something to to kind of get pulled towards or pulled off to start moving, then just like an engine, you know it it won't it won't start without a starter motor. 
So cool. Yeah, this is good stuff. Uh, yeah, we'll see what see what we can do and and uh, reconvene uh, next time and and talk about it on Slack and and who knows it might be uh, might be simple or it might be uh, <laughs> it might be end up digging into it for for a while. I look forward to either either condition. Let's see. I think uh, no, that's a good summary. I don't I don't have much to report from uh, from. From my side, uh, I was able to give a report about uh, our public outreach uh, for DSES uh, and ORI and QRZ and, and all our activities at DEF CON uh, at the DSES engineering meeting uh, last night, and it was it was great. It's really nice to be able to, to collaborate with an organization that's doing uh, similar things, and I hope in the future to to be able to kind of propose some some experiments uh, once we get uh, our our radios uh, working really well and reliable I think there's a lot of overlap and and things that we can uh, we can do uh, with uh, DSES what's coming up in early October is uh, the digital update for microwave so it's a workshops in Vancouver British Columbia what we did is we took lemons and made lemonade uh, all five of our proposed talks to uh, microwave update were rejected they didn't even get uh, to the to the review committee they were uh, deleted by the organizers um, that didn't like digital didn't like uh, space I don't know uh, so we weren't alone the AMSAC Canada folks got their uh, presentations deleted as well so we collaborated with them and set up a alternate event um, with a tour of the the uh, CubeSat lab uh, from uh, the University of Victoria, and uh, you know any anyone's welcome. We'll be doing a series of of workshops. We'll work really hard, collaborate with folks, anybody that wants to to meet up with us over that week, and then publish everything as a set, series of what we're calling notebooks. So we'll we'll keep track of everything and and publish it. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, we'll be working on there. And uh, we'll also be learning a whole lot about what AMSAT Canada is up to. So AMSAT Canada is new. This is a new organization, and they are forging ahead with some some really nice technical and uh, and educational outreach uh, work. So the folks have been uh, great to work with. So we're we're going to turn this uh, into a good experience and a positive. Uh, sort of uh, technical and social thing for for anybody that's interested in uh, citizen science and in amateur microwave. And that'll conclude so far, running from about the second to the ninth of October, um, and then the rest of October we'll be we'll be back here in San Diego hosting things and and uh, and helping things uh, come about. All right, that's that's all I've got. Any any last questions or comments or or anything that anybody needs before we close? Maybe just um, a recommendation for the. I was just trying to find the uh, suitable Xilinx uh, JTAG um, device. So I, if there's a recommendation for one, I'd appreciate it. Oh, a, a JTAG device. I don't know, Paul. Do you have any recommendations there? Oh, so the Pluto for the ILA. Um, so if I put an ILA into the into the FPGA, I need a JTAG um, adapter that would allow the um, Vado to perform the ILA functions. You know, get the data out of the uh, ILA on the FPGA. Okay, um, I do have a thing, an adapter hook up to the JTAG port on the Pluto in the remote lab. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a picture and and uh, if we can track down the order, that shouldn't be too hard. Well, Just probably, to show, probably like on the device itself. But... Yeah. Yeah. If you guys are going to be here for a few minutes, I'll go do that right now. Yeah. Sure. All right. I'll be back. All right. And Paul, you're back. You have the floor. Okay. I've, I've posted two photos into the chat. Um, you need two gizmos to have the rig that I've got. Um, one is from Analog Devices. It's called the ADALM UART JTAG. And it plugs directly into the uh, port on the Pluto, which you'll have to populate with a connector probably. And the other is the JTAG HS3, 
Rev A, which is what I have shown in the other photo. Okay, the yeah, the HS3 is the digital device I was looking at. Okay. Yeah. And you need the this little bo analog, uh ADI board. Yeah, it, it interfaces the digital board to the Pluto. Um it's a little little more than just uh wiring up the connector correctly, but not much more. Great. I, I think it comes with this little ribbon cable too, but I, I believe the only surgery required on the uh, on the Pluto was to install the connector. I wouldn't swear to that. No, that's right. That's what I recall. The connector is not populated normally, and you also I think didn't we have to like cut the case? Like you oh, have yeah. to kind of no like to get, use the standard blue plastic case. Uh, there's no way to get that cable out. That's why you can see here the Pluto is open. Yeah. Some people cut it away and then put the case back on. Yeah, we didn't yeah. do that. Yeah, but we you, yeah, there's no way to do this, and then also have the you have to like do a little bit of surgery on the case to to get it to all work. So I, I guess the Pluto board's not a standard uh, Xilinx JTAG connector then. That's so that's the port. That's why you need this little ADI board is to. That's my recollection. Yeah, it's not. It this this allows it to to be uh connected up so no it's not the not a standard xilinx connection could you use just use flying leads potentially i'm just kidding. i don't know there's I mean, some i need to look at the other side of it i think that actually is a uart on there uh it converts the uh, um the port on the on the pluto to one of these little uart based things like you have on the xilinx boards mm -hmm. i think if you look up the a down you you are jtag you'll get all the information you need Let me yeah check. Looking for it. it says 58 dollars on the on the adi site but then when you go to the distributors it's about 75 <laughs> yikes oh wow. i don't recall spending that much but prices do vary yeah there's definitely a like a uart size chip on there looking on the analog.com website at the, it page for that product Okay, no, that that's really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. It does make it, um, it does help a lot <laughs> with using it as a development target to to be able to open up JTAG. So it was definitely worth it. Uh, but yeah, some some surgery required. Yeah, analog explains. Um, for many embedded devices, we did not include the serial or JTAG programmability for space and cost reasons. So if you need to reprogram the devices, you'll need the small breakout board to do so. And I think it's just a matter of providing that UART. Instead of a small matter of programming, it's a small matter of soldering. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and knowing the right thing to order it always helps. And this this page also confirms that it does come with a little ribbon cable. So you don't need to build that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any any last questions or comments before we we close. Not for me, thanks. All right. Yeah, this has been a great week. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you everybody so much and uh, see you on Slack. Thank you.